Miss Courtney Ellis in the house. Got What's you. Up? Uh, so, so a couple weeks ago, I got I had the honor of interviewing you, and uh, your book is is out now. And full disclosure, I did order the book. I got it right here. And but I had to. I went audio because I wanted to knock it out and, and uh, go through it. This this right here just says, "Look at me, I'm fierce." That's that pose. That's right. That's right. Shine <laughs> fierce, you know. Uh, uh, so the the whole the fear. Obviously, you're like this fearless woman. Uh, is that something that was always in you, or did you kind of develop that as you? Um, I think anybody who's known me throughout my life would probably say. I've always been um, fearless on some things, for sure. But more importantly, it's not about fear. It's about ambition. Like, yeah. I was the kid who was going to get what I wanted no matter what hurdle you put in front of me. Right, right. Got it. So, uh, so those uh, uh, single women out there, the book is geared towards single women and empowering. Yeah. And I don't uh, – obviously, that's the best part of the book. And I don't want to go through everything because I want people to buy it. But there are just some points I wanted to go, uh, cover with you. Uh, okay. Starting with the TED Talk, Tracy McMillan. Tell me about that. <laughs> you have to watch it yourself. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. It's yeah, awesome. what did you get from it? Well, the whole marry yourself thing is what I pulled out of it. Right. Um, she couldn't uh, – the fact that she was saying that she couldn't be happy until she was happy with herself. Right. And I think that the, the, the thing about um, the economics of relationships right now is that there's still a remnant of the Cinderella story inside most women that I know. Right. And we are extremely capable of being providers, of, uh, of being great moms, et cetera, et cetera. We can wear all of these hats and it is like super exhausting. But there is that feeling that maybe we're going to meet somebody who's going to make all of our problems go away. And they're going to make that go away with money. Yeah. Like, we're waiting to be saved. Right. But what I realized as a single woman is that the more my income and portfolio grow, the higher the quality of partner I attract. Right. And on some level, that's simply because I a few years ago decided I was going to put myself first and stop waiting for someone else to take care of me. And being constantly disappointed was really um, exhausting. And right. for most of us, by the time you hit 40, that's 20 years of disappointment. You know, it's like <laughs> lots of <laughs> uh, you know, in the beginning, it's like, wow, he, you know, these, the guys are like young and they're so cool and they have potential, but they're not making any money. Meanwhile, I'm working, you know, so I'm earning. Then you get to another level and it's like, well, they could be doing better at their job. You know, they're not making enough money. They're playing it safe. And I'm working. I'm right. working. And finally, at a certain level, I'm like, dude, where, where's the con contribution, you know? <laughs> right. And, the and partnership. Then, oh, I actually just realized I never needed it. Right. And realize you never need it then you can accept people on their own terms without feeling like they've um like they've let you down and i think a lot of modern single women if you ask them about their relationships they would tell you that there's something about dating as a you know 30 to 40 year old woman that is disappointing Gosh. you know yeah and, and just i think you would agree with me that we both uh, our pro marriage is just there is a segment of the population that isn't considered and just statistically a lot of the single people out there and so what would you to the woman who's thinking about purchasing a home um, yeah. what are like because I know you probably hear it all the time what what are the big fears give me one or two okay so my hypothesis is I think if a woman is unmarried and she's renting she thinks that if she buys something that it's like she's committing to a life of living alone like she won't have the flexibility to move to denver when mr wright comes along or something like that like it, it's it's like a commitment to 
um, a lot of being alone. <laughs> right, right. Which, you know, you talk about, and it's a theme that runs throughout the book. And it, I, as I was listening, I was thinking, man, she's sitting in on the meetings I have with people. And it's that five to seven year rule about home buying, which yep. our pet, maybe our grandparents and uh, the, the relatives before them, they're always pretty static. Like they're in yeah. the house for 30 years, same job for 30 years, but it's just not that way anymore. And most people don't pay in their mortgage five, seven years. That's it. It's this normalcy era kind of like hangover that we have where we want the cul-de-sac and the picket fence and it's going to be the house we live in for 30 years. That's what we think when we're shopping for houses. But in reality, most people are making more money five years into their home, first home. They're making more money. They've you know, they have a partner now, maybe they have a kid, something's changing right. and they usually end up selling. So it's also fascinating that when people are looking to finance houses, they are naturally um, attracted to the 30 year conventional loan. And I tell people, maybe you should ask your lender about adjustable rate mortgages. I know they got like a bad rap during the crash, yeah. but yeah. if you're only planning to own this home for five to seven years, and there's no prepayment penalty, and you could maybe even be paying more principal down than you would on a conventional loan at a cheaper interest rate, and you'll be making smaller monthly commitments. This is the best option. You know, you've got options. You don't have to commit for 30 years. Right. Preach, sister. Preach. Uh, <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, I just actually refinanced somebody, a woman, a single woman that she was in an arm. I put her in an arm uh, about six years ago. And uh, she wanted to get out of the arm, and we, I, I just ran the scenarios, and it just made sense. Now, because of the crash, there may have been some people stay, there's people staying in their homes, maybe seven, eight years. But on, in general, five to seven years is really where you should be projecting. Yeah, and so if, if you are going to stay in it, then you refinance out of the adjustable rate. It's as simple right. as that. Or, but the Good. The other thing is about the marriage thing, because it is important to say, I'm not anti-marriage at all. I right. simply think that it makes uh, no sense to postpone starting your financial um, planning to, like, to wait for a uh, marriage or to be leaning on a 401k. 401ks are, in my opinion, a much lower return and riskier investment in the long run than real estate. Right. And yeah. One, one piece of real estate you can leverage so many different ways, you know, HELOCs, for example, home equity line of credit, you can take $200,000 out, start a kombucha company. When you start making money with the kombucha company, you can put that money back in, you know, so that you are paying off the HELOC and you have $100,000 maybe left over that you could put in a pool or do whatever other improvement you want to do that increases the value of your house and the enjoyability of your house. Right. You can't do that with a 401k. Right. You know? so it's really yeah. not, this is, um, it's important to note that if the fear for a woman is that she doesn't want to commit to buying real estate because she's psychologically thinking that some, something's going to happen where she's going to need to move, I would encourage that woman to imagine that she doesn't have to live in the real estate she buys. And if it works for two years, great. Since the, the loans are front loaded with interest, right. she can have tenants move in and start leveraging that asset, make it make money for you, and then sell it after a cycle, like sell it after 10 years. Take that money and buy the house of your dreams. Now you've got the man of your dreams, the house of your dreams, and you yourself are financially secure. So you right. never feel abandoned in the relationship you never feel abandoned by your own like lack of saving or, or, you know, if you talk to women who are like making real money and you ask them how much money they are saving, there's, it's not a lot. Like right. people are making good money, but they're not saving it. In most cities, rent is actually the thing we spend the most of our income on, on a monthly basis. So it's like, wait a second. Yeah. You're spending all that money to pay somebody else's mortgage. Why are you not spending it on your own? Yeah. You know, heard, just uh, if nothing else. Yeah. I heard one of the most brilliant things. This was just yesterday. Someone said, you know, people are, you know, one of the pushback is, oh, the interest rates are going up. And the reply was, well, rent is a hundred percent interest rate. And I, <laughs> right. Wow, exactly. I never and thought rent always goes up. 
Yeah, that that's brilliant. So there was something in there that you just said, and I wanted to point it out because it's a great takeaway. And you talked about cycles, and people are worried about you know buying, and then the market goes down. You you talk about that the the whole buy and hold thing. Yeah, you have to sell at the right time. That's it. There's no bad time to buy, and I say to again to like first time home buyers who come to me, I'm like. Imagine that you were buying your first house in 1970 and then you sell it in 2016. You think you're not making a ton of profit? Like you can go back to any boom in, in real estate recent history right. and see that the people who bought it, what they thought was the top of the market. And that's why I included all those newspaper articles at the end of the book because you can see people were reporting on booms since the 1800s. Yeah. You know, it can never get higher. It can never get higher. And of course it got higher. Of <laughs> course it got higher. Well, because the population is going up. Population, demand, inflation, everything. So in terms of like, um, you know, so anyway, my point is, is that there's never a bad time to buy, even if you feel like you're outside your comfort zone and an appreciating market, you're among all the buyers feeling that way. It's not like you're the only one. And I also try to encourage people to remember that that part of your brain, that reptilian part that's saying, yes. don't take a risk, everything's fine, just the way it is, don't do anything to risk anything, um, is the part that it, it exists, you can acknowledge it, but if you look at the actual data of people who own real estate over a 10 year period or longer, right. they are the ones who have the most money. Like. There's no accident that right. the billionaires in our world are real estate magnets. You know, that's, that's, yeah. The proof of it, you know, yeah. right. That's where the, you follow, don't reinvent the wheel, follow what they're doing. And you said that you talked about the reptilian brain is also that that comes in effect when people are looking at, once they make the decision, they start looking and then sometimes they, they, they start thinking too much. Right. Yeah, that's right. I always say like, Okay, here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to get the idea that you want to buy something, and that's really exciting. You talk to a lender, you get pre-approved for what feels like way more than you thought you were going to get pre-approved for. And then you start hunting, and nothing looks good enough at your price point. And this happens no matter whether you're at a $200,000 price point or $2 million price point. It's the same process. Right. So your brain goes, wow, my money doesn't go far as far as I want it to go. And then say you find something, you love it, you're in multiple offers, you're, you're stretching to get it, you think, because you're basing that off the list price. You're the winning offer out of 11 offers. And then your brain goes, so I call you and I say, you got the house. And then your brain goes, oh my God, <laughs> I'm the guy who paid the most out of 11 people. Am I making a mistake? <laughs> yeah. And then, right, the, the person. And then your brain starts saying, okay, there must be something wrong with it. And yeah. that is unfortunately when we go into the physical inspection process. So there's an actual general home inspector there to make sure you know every single thing about this house. Right. <laughs> Bad right. and good. But, you know, just to add that, like, you're right, there's something going wrong here. You know, it's not perfect. So right. you have to have a real estate professional walking you off the ledge saying, like, it's okay. Um, this is normal. We're going to ask them for a credit. We'll ask them to address these issues. It's a house. Thank goodness it's a house, and we get the we have the right to inspect it. Right, and you can make it. You can make it their own. Your yeah, your brain has to get through that process of thinking. Oh my God, I'm making a mistake before it can be like, okay, this is a this is a risk I can manage. That's where real estate professionals come in. But the other thing about that psychological like experiment of home of home buying or any big decision making for people is that when the market's going up. They think that they're paying too much for the house, but your brain doesn't, when the market goes down, go, Oh, now's a great time to buy. I'm going to buy something as the prices are going down. Like I'm going to buy this today for 400 tomorrow. It's going to be worth 375. Great time to buy. Nobody does that. Right. right. So they're, you know, they're actually, if you're letting this part of your brain do your thinking for you, it should be allayed by like the concerns should be allayed by the fact that the market is on an uptrend. Yes. You know? Well, but it will eventually level off. But in my world, what I'm seeing is no high-risk loans. I'm not seeing the 5% down loans winning. I'm not seeing the 10% down loans winning. I'm seeing 20% down to cash. And that means people have equity in their houses. They are not going to foreclose. If, you know, there's right. Because they got skin in the game. Yeah. They, they got, got skin in the game. Exactly. 
Yeah, well, one of the, oh, well, there's so much I love about the book, but the main, if, if I could say one thing about it is it's for someone who's look, thinking about buying, but you also have some great stuff in the second half of the book about people who are looking to do some real estate investing. And I don't even necessarily want to get into that because that's really juicy stuff and some great information. The mortgage people you talk to, great advice there. I'm all on board with everything they said. Uh, but you, you're uh, kind of making it easy. It's almost like a real estate for dummies, but you, you've catered it to the single woman and say, hey, you know, make it happen. Right. right that's right. I mean, look, you don't if you don't want to buy something to live in, if that's not your jam, there are so many other possibilities like buying a multifamily and getting some cash flow or flipping or partnering with a contractor. And, and even if you make thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, but you get the experience of choosing countertops and tiles and creating something and front yeah. door color, and there's some joy in that for you and a little money, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's there to be, it's there to be used. And so I just feel like, um, in this, work a day life that we live um having something that gives you something back and something you can contribute like flipping a house um or or even like beautifying a rental property or something like that there's something in it for the soul too it's not just you know capitalism yeah, yeah. Capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you have a lot of examples of different price points too in there which i think adds to how great this book is uh, for anybody because someone may think oh well, i don't live in la or i don't live in new york i mean you have you talk about a woman who's bought purchased in illinois for fifty thousand yeah. dollars like, yeah that's that's great advice you, and also you have uh every chapter you have quotes from famous people was yeah. there one of your one of them i know it's like asking was who's your favorite child but what's one of the quotes is one of your favorites out of those i actually like the chapter one quote about land not flying away yeah, right. It, well, was that the one that uh, Mark Twain, by land, they're not making it any? No, it's not Mark Twain. I have to go back and look at it. Hold on. <laughs> You're putting me on the spot. I didn't memorize all of the quotes. Here, I have it. You can look at it up. No, I, no I have it right here. It's a, it is a comfortable feeling uh, to know that you stand on your own ground. Land is about the only thing that can't fly away. And that's, that's it. Uh, Anthony Trollope. There you right. go. Boom. I got you. I got you. Back. Okay. One last thing I want to talk about, because I want some people who, women who are looking at this to have some great takeaways. You talk yeah. about a blog called Bigger Pockets. Oh yeah. Bigger Pockets. So Bigger Pockets is, and it's kind of like, um, they have meetups and stuff like that. It's an investment. It's like how to invest in real estate, um, website and, and local groups. And it's actually, it's really good information. And, in my world, like most of the flippers I work with actually do get together and meet people who are interested in getting in the game and they share resources and they make a community out of it using the bigger pockets. Right. And so but almost any question you have about real estate investing or flipping is on there. Oh, gotcha. On that site. Speaking of communities, you have, you have like a, a, a group of, the, of, of realtors that you uh, can refer to. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so as a result of my FYI TV show, we went to a lot of American cities to film that show and partnered with realtors. So I have this incredible network um, of real estate agents. And so I wanted to encourage women who are looking at the site or reading the book uh, to get plugged into this network of powerful females who understand the journey and the mis mission and the agenda. <laughs> and I will partner them with an amazing real estate agent, wherever they are. Got it. So how would someone get in contact with you? No, first, how would they get the book? The book is available on amazon.com and Barnes and Noble. Right. And I'm, I'm going to leave the links uh, in this video. Okay. Um, and, and then uh, what about getting in contact with you if a, if a realtor wants to be in your network? Sure. Um, anyone can send me an email to Courtney at acme-re.com or go to breakupwithyourrental.com. There's also a contact form on that site. Awesome. Thanks again. I know you probably got some Oscar party to go to, so you go oh, do yeah. that thing. And uh, best luck in the book sales. And Thank actually, you, I'm, I'm thinking I want to talk to you about some other stuff in real estate because you're now, you're now my uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> Have a fantastic I would be happy to. Have a fantastic Sunday.
Thank you so much. You got it. Yeah.